Hi, welcome to another episode of Family Matters. I'm Chloe Leary, the Executive Director of the Winston Prouty Center. And Family Matters is a show we do to talk about matters of interest to families with young children. So um, I can now say it is an award-winning show. So we are excited to be the Community Partner of the Year for BCTV. And, um, and I'm very excited today to talk with Billy Slade about play-based learning. Um, so this is a hot topic, as Billy said. She um, actually, uh, I've written an article for the paper, and you wrote an article for Women Child Care's mm -hmm. newsletter. So right. we're right there thinking about play-based learning. So um, welcome, and thanks Thank for you. coming. Thanks for having me. Um, why don't we start with hearing a little bit about you and why I would ask you to come talk with us about play-based learning. Well, most of my life has been spent in early childhood. Um, I was the oldest of six kids and then went on to become a family child care provider and taught in a kindergarten classroom, mm -hmm. was the director of a center, but always around children from infancy to about five or six. And then um, moved from Wisconsin back home to Vermont, where I'm originally from, a couple of years ago. And so now I'm serving as a mentor for Wyndham Child Care, where I go into family child care programs mm -hmm. and help them work on improving the quality. So that's my current hat that I'm wearing. Great. Good. Well, I, I know that. Um, as it, when I thought of this topic, uh, we thought of you because of all your years of experience. And um, why don't we start with, what does play-based learning mean? When people say that phrase, like, what are we talking about? I think it means different things to different people. I think some people sort of hijack the term and, and think that if they have um, 15 minutes of play in their day, then they're a play-based learning program. And that's not really accurate. <laughs> I think that um, play and learning are not um, two sides of the same coin. They really are the same thing. Young children learn best through play. There's lots and lots of research that supports that. Mm -hmm. and, and when we try to separate the two is when the, the waters get muddied, I think. And, um, sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, they're just playing, and yet we know that so much is going on when they're just playing, that they're you know, developing social skills, mm -hmm. emotional skills, res building resiliency, learning cooperation, developing concepts of math, language. So many different things are happening because they're engaged in something that's meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. So for young children, the um sort of that where they are developmentally, the appropriate way for them to sort of keep learning how to be in the world is through their play. Exactly. Like that is their work or exactly. their learning. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and I think sometimes in our culture we tend to um, look down on that as not being as valuable as actual like teaching time, for example, circle time or, or a rug time where the teacher's in charge and is asking all the children to sit crisscross applesauce and then she will teach them something. <laughs> mm -hmm. But instead, the majority of the real learning is happening when they're able to engage in things that they've chosen, mm -hmm. that are, are something that is meaningful to them, and that they're given the time, the space, and the materials to really explore deeply rather than somebody imparting information. Instead, they're getting to do the discovering mm -hmm. on their own. Mm -hmm. That's a great example, I think, of a very typical sort of early education classroom mm -hmm. is circle time. Mm -hmm. um, and I just caught, you know, the a phrase teacher directed or adult directed right. versus I guess the alternative being when kids choose so that seems like an element of play-based learning to think uh, about in terms of um, how to set up a classroom or how an adult interacts with that play. Exactly, exactly. It's um, one of the best definitions I ever heard of play was from a five-year-old expert who said, <laughs> play is what I do when people stop telling me what to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that as teachers, we oftentimes, we've been trained, you know, educated to believe that our role is to impart information to children, when really I see my role as an instigator, as an awakener, as someone who, who sort of sets mm -hmm. the stage, offers the invitation, and then gets out of their way and lets them figure out what it is they most need to learn and most want to learn, because all the other things come into play. Everything that, no, no pun intended. No pun intended. <laughs> um, all the things that we want children to learn in order to be ready for school will happen in the course of play if we've been intentional in the planning for it beforehand. Mm -hmm. That, I think, I was just sitting here thinking of that point, that when people say just play, um, play isn't play isn't play. So I think you said something really important right there, being intentional. So if we think about like how, how does that happen? If we're the adult or the teacher in charge of being an instigator or a facilitator of learning, how do we do that? 
Uh, how do we be intentional? I think so much of it happens ahead of time. Um, I oftentimes get frustrated when I hear, you know, where are your lesson plans? And, and oftentimes people think that means this is what children will learn from what is being taught uh -huh. today. Mm. But often children learn things very, very different from what we thought they were going to learn. So I would love to see a lesson plan to incorporate a piece of what did they actually learn as opposed to just what we planned for them to learn. So when teachers have an opportunity to, huh. to set out um, materials uh, some morning, mm -hmm. the, what they decide to put out on the tables in the morning, that's part of the intentionality. When they have a conversation with a co-teacher about what they think might happen in the course of, of mm -hmm. offering those materials, that's part of the intentionality. And then also the piece that's probably key to me is the open heart piece, the piece that at the end they're open to the idea that maybe they learned something entirely different. Maybe mm -hmm. they learned what you wanted and something that was even more meaningful to them that will stay with them. Mm -hmm. So it's a, I often think that, that that would be a more valuable thing for teachers to be able to do some lesson plans that reflect after the fact, mm -hmm. you know, to show this is what they actually learned and to use that as a foundation for what comes next. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard, uh, you know, I've heard a lot about sort of um, child-directed learning, so mm -hmm. following their lead or, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, um, just that notion. And the piece I haven't heard that you just brought up that I think is really interesting is that debrief is so important. So it's not, you know, you might, um, and that specific question, what did they learn that I didn't know they were going to learn? It seems like a really good way to target that intentionality. Mm -hmm. not I to think so too. And I think um, for some teachers it's easier than others. You know, some teachers feel like they failed if they didn't learn the concept or the idea that they hoped they would learn, but instead it might be something even more relevant to that particular child's experiences. Mm -hmm. and, and to be open to that mm -hmm. because I, I, I'm a true believer in the fact that that the letters and the numbers and the colors, those things can all happen in the course of play. And it doesn't have to be a worksheet. It doesn't have to be a flashcard. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a teacher standing or sitting at the, at the head of circle time imparting information. Instead, children can be surrounded with materials mm -hmm. and an environment that really is conducive to that. And, mm -hmm. and in fact, it's probably preferable to learning it in any other way. Mm -hmm. And I think you bring up a great point. Something I'm certainly worried about that tension between being ready for school um, the sort of what are those what's the common core where are we going to push that down to you know little babies have to like what would that mean for them um, so there's a pressure to be ready for school there's sort of expectations or flashcards or worksheets that are a traditional way of doing it but that's not going to work in early childhood so how do we sort of um, where do you see that tension showing up or how do you sort of talk with people who might say well my kid's not ready for school I think that there's a, um, there's a real element of fear on the part of parents and on the part of some teachers that they, their child won't be ready, that teachers are going to feel responsible for getting them ready for the next stage, the parents are going to feel responsible if their child isn't ready, then they didn't send them to the right preschool mm -hmm. setting or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I really believe there's an overemphasis on readiness in our culture. I think that, that we're so focused on what comes next that we miss the beauty of the here and now. Mm. And so we're getting three-year-olds ready to be four-year-olds, but right now they're really amazing three-year-olds. Mm -hmm. and, and what's lost when we're so focused on what comes next? I think I shared with you um, in a previous conversation about Bev Boss's quote about you know, only to children do we do this sort of thing where we, you, we expect them to sacrifice who they are now to become who they will be. Mm -hmm. And we don't do that to 40 year olds. We don't take a sledgehammer and break their legs in preparation for being <laughs> using a walker when they're, when they're 80. You know, we don't do that because we know that who mm -hmm. they are right now is valid. And mm -hmm. I think that that's a big piece of it. Um, Oftentimes you'll see parents who are comparing their children to someone else's kids and are worried mm -hmm. that, oh, but they're learning to write their names or they're learning mm -hmm. to, you know, to add or whatever it might be. And oftentimes it's just a matter of individual readiness. Children mm -hmm. need to have an opportunity to develop at their own pace. And not all four-year-olds are going to do things mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so if they're given an opportunity to really develop their curiosity, to have um, space and time to play deeply, they're much more likely to be enthusiastic, lifelong learners instead of being able to just spit out information mm -hmm. that um, that says they're ready for the next stage. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and oftentimes I see that the people who, who push their kids and are, are pretty high pressure about them being able to do all the things they want them to be able to do for the next stage um, later on down the road 
there's regrets many mm -hmm. times because they realize their kids are either burned out or they're bored or they figured out that they, they only are going to be spitting out information for a teacher or for a test as opposed to really caring about what it mm -hmm. is that they're learning. And that uh, seems to me like that, that, that what's developmentally appropriate. So you d I love that analogy of we're not going to break a 40-year-old's leg so they know how to use a walker. That, um, and, you know, the, if we think about this time of life and how fast the brain is developing and taking advantage to, cr to help kids be those curious thinkers mm -hmm. and critical thinkers and learners, now is the time exactly. that uh, we have plenty of time for rote memorization, hopefully. Exactly. And I think the other um, thing I would observe is uh, they, they won't actually be ready to learn if you do that with them. They aren't available. They haven't figured out how to be learners. They've just figured out how to do what you told them to do. Exactly. Which are important skills, you know, I think um, that, that social, let, maybe talk a little bit about that. Um, what, what does it mean to be ready? If we were, like, it, it, I, when I think of school readiness, I don't think, can I write my, can the kids who leave if the Priority Center write their letters and numbers right. and write their name, what do I think of? So what are some, when you do think of, well, what does that mean? What can they, what have they learned to be ready to go into kindergarten? What do you think are those skills? I, I, think it, I think it varies from teacher to teacher as far as what they think, but my own personal feeling about it is, are they able to coexist with, with their classmates? Mm -hmm. Are they able mm -hmm. to um, problem solve? Are they able to initiate? Are they able to um, be kind? Are they able to trust their own instincts? That's a big part mm -hmm. of it for me. Um, do they have curiosity still, or has it been tested out of them? Mm -hmm. Do they know what it is to be a, a leader? I mean, do they feel like they have something that they're competent in so mm -hmm. that they, when they go into a classroom, whether it's with children that they already know or new children, do they feel confident in themselves, comfortable in their own skin so that they can um, ask questions? Mm -hmm. you know, I think that's a big part mm -hmm. of it. Is do, do they, are they scared they're going to get the answer wrong or are they willing to go and ask questions mm -hmm. and, and get the answers that they're looking for? Um, I think they're all very abstract things that don't show, necessarily show up on a test. Right. No, it's hard to to test those social emotional skills mm -hmm. or social mm -hmm. emotional readiness. Um, and I think, you know, I'm just thinking of that circle time. So, and the, um, you know, part of learning to sit in circles, like can I sit here and participate with the group? But it's not about compliance with the teacher asking me to do crisscross applesauce and sit quietly. It's helping them learn and develop the skill. Like, well, what are some tools you might need as a kid to sit here and, and be part of the group? Because really being part of the group is the thing we want to learn, not what the weather is today. Right, exactly. Um, but, you know, that, again, back to intentionality a little bit and thinking about what do we, what do we want to impart, I guess, if we if we have to do some of that. Right. So. Um. And I, I think finding a balance is the trick is, you know, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a, a, a morning gathering. I'm not saying that children shouldn't learn to be part of a group. What I am saying is that should not be the end all and be all of what our, our teacher responsibilities mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. But instead, we've got, we've got a real obligation to these children to pay attention to who they are individually mm -hmm. and as a group mm -hmm. and to try to plan experiences that are going to be relevant and meaningful for that mm -hmm. particular child or that group of mm -hmm. children and not just something that's, I have a friend who calls it embalmed curriculum. <laughs> where <laughs> where you just you know because it's November you pull the turkey stuff off the shelves and um, and that's not respectful of this right. particular group of children. Maybe they don't care about turkeys right. and pilgrims. Maybe what they really care about is that they have a new baby at home that mm -hmm. takes up all their mom's attention, or that they're going to have to move mm -hmm. and leave their best friend behind. Mm -hmm. Some of that's part of the whole intentionality thing. Teachers knowing children mm -hmm. well enough to be able to plan those meaningful experiences. Mm -hmm. That, and I think that brings me to another sort of criticism or challenge or back to the definition of play um, is that it isn't about letting kids run around the classroom no. and not no. thinking mm -hmm. about, um, you know, what that environment looks like. But finding, and it might be that you float ideas. So, right, let's not trot out the turkey ha -ha, on no November, right. but uh, let's acknowledge that, wow, there are lots of, you know, it might be something... Um, that in, it, you might not have an agenda about the turkey, but you might right. put out some turkeys and see what right. happens and then go somewhere else completely. Right, exactly. Or something like that. So It really is following their lead. You know, you mm -hmm. hear the term child-led curriculum, and, and again, it's one of those terms that kind of gets thrown around and means different things to different people. But if you're taking the time to pay attention to who those children are, mm -hmm. you'll know if they're interested in turkeys or what direction mm -hmm. it might go in, but again, being open mm -hmm. to what direction it might not. Mm -hmm. um, it can be a way to 
discover other maybe cultural traditions that are important to the children in your program. Mm -hmm. It can be a way for them to learn respect for each other's traditions. There's just all sorts of ways that it could go that isn't what we might have thought. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that's the idea of, of really paying attention to, ch to children, mm -hmm. I think, and trusting that they'll figure out what it is they most need to learn from whatever it is that you have planned for them. Mm -hmm. when, when, when people, I can imagine, I guess, as a teacher, and I haven't been a teacher, so um, I can imagine some pressure around planning. Mm -hmm. So what do you, when you talk with people about this or when you observe classrooms and um, sort of help people be intentional, what are some of the biggest challenges they have? Or parents even, I mean, I'm thinking parents at home might also have this sort of like, oh, I have to do these things. Mm -hmm. Sort of how to be that responsive in the moment or, you know, what are some of the things that come up for people? What I see is that communication is key, and so it might be that, that teachers are thinking that parents are going to be expecting certain things. You know, if it's Thanksgiving time, they expect to see that handprint turkey. Or if it's Halloween, you know, they, they see the, the jack-o'-lanterns on the wall and they all look exactly the same. Or resisting the temptation to rearrange the eyes on the jack-o'-lantern because they're down below the mouth or whatever it might be. That we somehow, I think, we get tied up with um, what children are doing is a reflection of how successful we are as teachers or as mm -hmm. parents. And it's just not true. Mm. It's, it's one of those things where if, if we are trusting children, again the term trusting children, to be able to um, do with the art materials what they see fit, mm -hmm. then they don't all look the same. If we um, have communication with parents as teachers that um, this is why we're doing it this way, yours might not, your child's might not look like everybody else's, and that's, mm -hmm. that's not only okay, that's probably preferable. Mm -hmm. And to let parents know there might not be something coming home every day, there might not be a project that's gonna be in their backpack, mm -hmm. because that day they really wanted to just experience sensory things, or maybe they um, didn't wanna do art at all that day. Mm -hmm. and, and trying to just recognize, again, respect for the child themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're communicating that to parents from the very beginning, it, it sets up this um, dynamic that you're in this together and that parents don't have unrealistic expectations. And the flip side of it is, is from parents' perspective, that if they're thinking their child has to be the same as the three-year-old who mm. lives next door, it, it takes a lot of pressure off to remind them that every one of these children is mm -hmm. different and every one of them is gonna have their strengths and they're gonna have their challenges and, and that's the way human beings are. And mm -hmm. it's true of us, mm -hmm. it's true of children. Mm -hmm. And our, um, I'm just, it requires a flexibility, I think. Absolutely. Um, which I can imagine for some people and their temperaments might be hard to do, like mm -hmm. hard to let go. But mm -hmm. I really appreciate what you're saying, how much we, um, the like what kids are doing is not necessarily a reflection of us. There's not that, but there's right. so much pressure in society, and sometimes the best we can do is remind each other's parents and teachers that uh, if we're creating spaces right. for kids to, you know, we're respecting and trusting them and giving them sort of uh, these kinds of environments, that's the best we can do for them. Absolutely. So Absolutely. I, it seems to me that even though we're talking about sort of play based learning or education in the early years, this could apply beyond the early years. I'll Absolutely. just observe. I, I know it's out of our purview, but um, you know, it, it seems like it could go a long way to, to helping everybody sort of. And there's so much research out there that says that, that when you stop playing is when you start dying. You know, that just really as adults we need play in our lives mm -hmm. and it's different for everybody. It might be somebody who has, you know, a, a weekend softball team. It might be somebody who goes and joins a writing group. It's different for everybody. Mm -hmm. But when you don't have something that feeds your soul, it's really hard to be happy. Mm -hmm. And I, I heard an interesting quote that said, the opposite of play is not work. The opposite of play is depression. And mm -hmm. I think we're seeing that in younger and younger mm -hmm. children because they are having play taken away from them, whether it's it's um, in an early childhood environment because they're expected to spend a lot of time sitting or waiting in lines, mm -hmm. or an, in an elementary school environment where they're taking away recess or they're making lunches, no talk lunches or mm -hmm. whatever. There's less and less time to just have autonomy over your choices mm -hmm. and to be able to be a kid, basically. So I, I think that it is a problem throughout the ages. Mm -hmm. Right, those social emotional skills mm -hmm. sort of maybe we're seeing mm -hmm. the, the deficit in some yeah. of the um, things that are happening for older yeah. kids and people too. Absolutely. So I wonder, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, like how as a parent, like, or as a teacher, how do we, uh, some examples of engaging in play or being intentional without taking over 
So I am just trying to think of how to be a little concrete about what is this play-based learning stuff and how, you know, what's the adult role and how do we support kids to do it? So I don't know, can you think of a, of a, uh, either a situation that you've observed where a teacher or an adult really helped sort of support the play and let it, and help it go deeper? Like, how, what does that look like? Sure. Um, yeah, I do encounter that pretty often, actually. Um, I was in a, a family child care program yesterday, and I was watching a couple of two and three year olds um, arguing over a bucket of farm animals, and <laughs> um, and found myself. I was talking with the child care provider about um, we were talking about narrating and how oftentimes huh. as teachers, our, our role is to just give language to what's going on, and uh -huh. sometimes that's enough support. Um, in this case, it was escalating pretty quickly, and I was like, wow, he looks really angry. I wonder what could happen. You know, that kind of thing. Bam. No. Exactly. <laughs> that didn't happen. Instead, it was like the little boy looked up, and he hmm. went, he could have a cow, and that it was like that's all he needed was just somebody reminding him. You know, there was a choice oh. here. There was a fork in the road, and he could either hoard all the animals, or he uh -huh. could actually offer a cow. And the little guy looked back at me, and he looked at, like, "Wow, that was like <laughs> that was amazing." That he, but it was just a little bit of support. Sometimes it isn't physical; it isn't um, verbal support. It's physical support. Maybe mm -hmm. if you see a situation where children are are engaging in conflict, instead of even saying anything, moving yourself closer to the situation, mm -hmm. just physically positioning mm -hmm. yourself so that they know there's an adult there if they need support. And it's not meant to be a threatening presence. It's just, mm -hmm. there's a grown-up here. I'm safe. I can talk about mm -hmm. this and not worry that I'm going to get hurt about mm -hmm. it. Um, for parents, I think oftentimes we we think that there's a, a right way to play, mm -hmm. and there just isn't. Mm -hmm. It's it's something where, trust your own instincts, mm -hmm. teachers and children, I think we need to trust our own instincts. If it was something you enjoyed as a child, share that with your child. Mm. That's something that they're gonna, it's gonna be authentic, and they're gonna be able to tell that you're having a good time with them. Mm. There's no better gift than to, yeah. to really play with your kid and have them know that you're enjoying the time too, that you're not just looking at your watch and when is this over with kind of thing, yeah. but instead you're really engaged. Mm -hmm. I like how um, what you're saying about narrating that sometimes, you know, being didactic or like in that situation with the farm animals, for instance, like, you know, if you would just share, you right. might versus, right. huh, he's like an observation exactly. without, it's almost objective observation yeah. or somewhat yeah. that helps, that's a cue yeah. that then, so in that situation, the learning was, oh, maybe I should, how am I impacting yeah. somebody else? Maybe I could stop and observe or something, you know, that there's, that's where the education piece is. But exactly. it's really just about the farm animals. Exactly. If somebody were just looking at it and exactly. not thinking intentionally. And I think sometimes that's our, our first instinct is to come in and solve the problem for them. Oh, this is what right. they, this is what they need right now for me is for me to say, to remind them that they need to share. But I don't think you can force generosity and I don't no. think you can force remorse. No. Nope. And so, <laughs> you know, when you're forcing children to share, it's, um, it's artificial, it's adult instigated and it's not real and all they're feeling huh. is re resentment towards you or the child for taking you know the materials uh -huh. and the same thing with remorse when we tell can you say you're sorry uh, even if they yeah. say they're sorry mm -hmm. they're really not sorry mm -hmm. nine times mm -hmm. out of ten they're doing it to please an adult so instead saying I wonder what you could do to make them feel better you know, uh -huh. just a throwing uh, that's one of my favorite tools is I wonder I wonder uh -huh. and kids respond very well to that mm -hmm. because it's like you're you're in their corner and right. you're wondering what it is that, that could make the situation better that curiosity mm -hmm. piece, mm -hmm. and and there's learning there too, right? Absolutely. So you just created a, a door that opens, like, huh? I wonder. Inviting them to join, and then inviting them to think critically, so they come up with something, and you exactly. say, huh? That's interesting. But if we did that, that might happen, and that could be sort of an example exactly. of again, there's play-based learning right there. Exactly. Um, without, yeah. So it's. Um, and but, you're extending yeah. literacy. I mean, there's so many things that are right. happening that are not sitting there with a flash card. <laughs> yeah. You know, it just you think about how many natural opportunities there are during the course of the day, whether it's in a childcare setting or preschool or in your home environment, mm -hmm. opportunities to extend conversation and, and give them richer language, problem solving skills, mm -hmm. all of those things. And again it's being respectful of the child's role in all of that, mm -hmm. not just taking over and trying to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Which I think in our culturally we yep. just do a lot, yep. even for I mean I think about it even in my job, like if somebody comes to me with a problem, it's like, oh I gotta fix it. Like 
no, maybe I could do exactly the same thing. Like, mm -hmm. huh, what do you think we should do? Mm -hmm. And um, th there are opportunities all over the place for that. So, And it takes a while for, um, if children are used to having an adult swoop in and solve their problem, it takes a while for them to get mm -hmm. used to a change in style. Like mm -hmm. you talk about the flexibility piece. And you know, the first couple of times you do it, they're going to look at you like, Wait uh -huh. a minute, you mean I get to have a voice in this uh -huh. whole interaction uh -huh. here? But it's very empowering for mm -hmm. children to know that they do have some say, this choose your own adventure, which way am I going to go with this? And, mm -hmm. um, and I think that if teachers can trust, if parents can trust that children do have good ideas, mm -hmm. that's when it's likely to work. Mm -hmm. The, um, what, one of the words you used was authentic, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is like kids will know if you don't really want to be playing this game. So let's Absolutely. say, you know, I have a friend who, um, you know, there's some games that her kid wants to play that are really a little painful. Um, or, Candy you know, <laughs> I used to keep a blue card up my sleeve just to end the game when I, when I couldn't do it anymore. It was like <laughs> okay, so it's okay to have adult tricks maybe to exit the play. Good to know. Um, but, you know, how to find a, so back to child led, child directed. Um, and when we're joining in the player, we want to play with our kids how to, uh, how to be authentic and, uh, not without leading them to something else, I guess. Sort of that there seems to be some a potential tension there too. Like, I don't really want to play Candyland. I mm -hmm. guess it could be sort of. Uh, is there another game? You know, how about this game or this game? Or mm -hmm. you know that there. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do it because your kid wants to do it necessarily. That you get to have right. sort of a role in that too. Because if you don't, it's not authentic. There's not as genuine quality learning exactly, happening. Exactly, exactly. And they say kids and dogs can sense phoniness a mile away. You know, they know who, who's really being true and who's not. Right. And, um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that to a child that, you know what, that's not my favorite game, but maybe we could try this, or what about this, or uh -huh. you know, offering a couple of alternatives mm -hmm. and still letting them make the choice, but they're going to know. And you're not going to want to play very mm -hmm. long if it's something you really don't right. enjoy. Right. So I think that's a good point. Yeah, good. Um, I know you're going to find it's hard to believe, but we're actually really getting to the end of our time. Oh, wow. <laughs> I know I didn't even do our commercial break, but <laughs> if there, is there anything we didn't talk about um, that you want to make sure to share with people about play, the importance of play-based learning or how to make sure it's, um, you know, how to embed it or what's, what's, what's a key point? Um, I think just that, that play is a really meaningful way and a fun way for parents to be able to engage with their children, and it's also a way that children can learn to see their parents in a different light. Mm. And that's true of their teachers as well. I mm -hmm. see myself as a partner in learning, and so I think that sometimes we, if we remove that um, power dynamic of, mm. of grown-ups always have to have the power, but instead giving children some power, play is a wonderful way to do that. Mm -hmm. Right, nice. That's a safe, sort of creates that yep. safe space yep. for it. Good, that's lovely. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this has been really fun. And um, I appreciate you coming. Thank and I you. think we'll, you know, here's a, we will go ahead and do a, a message from Let's Grow Kids because I think it's a good, a good match for um, what we've been talking about. So great. Thank you. Thank you. For the youngest among us, playtime is more than just fun. It's learning and development. When we stimulate a child's curiosity and natural desire to connect with others, we help them develop the important skills needed for school, relationships, and life. Join Let's Grow Kids to help all of our children reach their full potential. Learning starts day one.